Oh, hey. You know, if you guys actually took the time to watch last season, I wouldn't have to slave over cutting in these recaps. I could be drinking coffee right now. Last time on Graveyard Cars, the ghouls got an assist from Ron Jenkins at Magnum Force, building out and installing the 392 Crate Hemi in Chris Jacobs' 1968 GTX. And they prepped out the brand new Crate Hellcat to be installed in our Superbird tribute car. Now, with only days before shipping these monsters of Mopar to SEMA, the crew needs to shift into high gear. They have to finish Jacob's GTX and custom fit the first ever Hellcat crate engine into this icon of NASCAR. But with the clock ticking and never before attempted customizing needed, the ghouls may not make it in time. As always, we've got a million things going at Graveyard Cars. You got 100 cars out in the lot. We're a busy shop. We do have two cars that need to make it to SEMA. That's a little dramatic. Chris Jacobs' car, so we've got the drivetrain installed in it. Now there's a lot of plumbing. There's O2 sensors, the drive shaft, the fuel system, the electrical, the, the Mopar controller unit. There's still a lot of things that have to be done. Now it doesn't mean if they're not done, we can't get to SEMA. We'll get to SEMA. But it'd be nice if the cars could move around and run and drive rather than just be pretty candy on the showroom floor. Equally, our Superbird. We still have to install the drivetrain and do all the things I just mentioned on the GTX, except times two because it's a supercharged Hellcat engine. We have lots to do. Those are our top priorities to be able to have these cars not only show up to the show, but be functional at the show in case somebody wants to do an article on them. Or more importantly, Monday night, I have what they call a red carpet event. This is where I'm supposed to drive the Superbird Hellcat up a ramp six feet in the air, flatten out. Then there's an MC. He's going to talk about the car, and I'm going to wave to everybody. It's one of those red carpet moments. It would be really nice to have, let's say, the car run and drive up the ramp, for one, and then be able to stop so I don't roll down the other side and kill somebody. So it, it, it really does need to be two cars that are functional, and so our back's up against a wall right this second. So right now the ghouls are going to start working on doing the plumbing, some of the plumbing on Chris Jacobs' car, all right? And our newly adopted ghoul, Mr. Joe Dirte, with the hair down here. You know he thinks he's Joe Dirt, right? I mean, I've told you that before. He, he runs around, he tries to change his last name, put an E on the end, church it up. Dirt. Not Joe Dirt too. that sucked. Joe Dirt the original. So with Chris's car, he's got a deal worked out with Magnaflow. They're going to actually put a complete system once he gets the car done and back and see him is over with. For right now, we just made some cuts in his original exhaust, reflanged them, welded some couplers on so they'd marry to the TTI headers, kind of just to get it by. I'm sure it'll sound great because the car probably sounded great before, but uh, eventually I think he's going to change that out to a Magnaflow system. The really cool thing about these headers are they, they bolt right, for one, bolt right to the 392 Hemi. They're designed to fit our Mopar, our B body, and they also have the ports already pre-welded in them for the O2 sensors, for the upstream O2 sensors. Uh, some applications need an upstream and a downstream. In the case of our 392 with the simplified wiring harness, we only need the two upstream O2 sensors, so this just kills uh, two birds with one stone. Put the headers on there, really cool, they sound nice, and they already have the O2 ports in them. Yeah, Mark's used to doing a lot of restoration stuff, as, as everyone knows. He is the resto go-to guy. And uh, when you get outside of his comfort zone a little bit on some of these types of projects, you can see where he has a new level of stress. I think it's on those particular days he might kind of want to get out of here a little early. Hey, look, I don't mind stepping back a bit when it comes to this custom stuff. It, it's fun, and it's, and it's got a lot of eyeball to it but my brain just operates on a completely different set of gears, metaphorically speaking, than aftermarket uh, add-on stuff that you can order out of a book. So I'm gonna move back, let Ron take over, because this is his cup of tea. Oh, Joe Dirt, he just loves this aftermarket stuff. Can't get enough of it. If he could have a Mopar without one OEM part on it, he would be thrilled to death. Butcher. So this particular uh, controller can use the O2 sensors, and it does use the O2 sensors. These are, I believe, called the upstream ones. And so there are leads that go into it, just like it would at the factory. It's just that TTI on their headers built an actual port real close to the same 
geometric location that the factory would have. So that's another bit of wiring. But because they're headers and not the manifolds, we have to extend both of those leads down to it and with the same gauge of wire, not to change the millivolts or whatever fancy schmancy talk they like to use. Make sure everything works and talks to the computer like it's supposed to. So right now, we're out of the woods on the 68 GTX, Jacob's car, other than maybe just checking some fluid levels and things like that. That thing's done. That means the whole team, all the ghouls and Dirte, are gonna move over to the Super Burn, start working on installing the engine, the transmission, and that. Today, I'm cutting the shaft on the steering column to shorten it up because we're putting the Hellcat engine inside the Super Bird. And hopefully, everything goes right. I'm gonna start welding it up in a minute. So last year we learned one of the first things we have to do besides changing the upper control arm mounting uh, stop points for the, for the bumpers is also to modify the steering column. The rack and pinion is located, especially the pinion point of the rack, is located at a different place entirely than the original integral steering gear. It also has a different kind of a coupler, they call it a double D coupler. So what we end up having to do is we end up shortening that shaft on the three quarter inch side of the shaft because it does taper up bigger. But down on that three quarter inch side, we have to make it shorter and we have to put the provision on it so that it'll slide through the header because it weaves through the header and onto that rack and pinion that Ron got us from Magnum Force. So I think right now we have all the modifications done at least that we can see and think of uh, in order for the Hellcat to go in. So that's the next step is mock that thing into place and cross our fingers. We're gonna lower the car down just like Chrysler did. Hope that it clears the aprons and the frame rails and all that stuff with the headers on there. Uh, but otherwise, the basic process is exactly the same. Okay, we're looking good on the right-hand side. So one of the things you run into when you put one of these six speeds in the car is oftentimes you run into shifter location issues. In this case, the guys have put the shifter pretty close to the original location. We're gonna have to make a little slight tweak to where the pistol grip comes out of the floor pan, but not gonna be a big deal. We're still good within, I would say, a millimeter. Okay, at still, the very most. Still good here. Make it 1.2 millimeters. And driver's side looks good. See where I'm at on this. Very good. A little too good. Is Pretty something, soon. Uh, feeding that thing. Am I missing something? Or? Yeah. Boy, if that goes in there with the headers on, it just made life great. Oh. So things are going together real well. All of the bolt uh, alignment holes for the K-member and the transmission cross member are going together, so that's exciting. I try not to get too excited until it's actually in there and the car is moving around. But at this point, it's feeling like a good green light go. As long as Murphy doesn't stick his fat little head in here and cause a problem, we're going to be out of the woods on it. The only problem is when everything's working out you know something's gonna go wrong. It's just too good to be true. So I got that feeling in the back of my head, it's Murphy's Law never fails. When things are going great, you're just waiting for something to go wrong. Not even close. Mother Coming up, the ghouls hustle to hook up the Hellcat Crate Hemi. Well, we did have plenty of room, we hit something. Things heat up for Mark when Ron springs an unexpected surprise. I got fire, baby! Finally, Mark and Dave test fire the Hellcat you know, pray to God that the thing lights up, so. But will this one-of-a-kind bird take flight? So Dave's feeding the wires through right now uh, into the firewall. And as soon as he gets those in place so they don't get bunched up, we can let the car down the rest of the way, hopefully line up with our K-member bolts. It's because it's such a tight fit, and we can't take it off the engine harness, or off of the engine itself, we have to lower the car down, just like we'd normally do it, and feed those wires through the very small openings that they have in the firewall that Dave's made for them. So it's a drop it down, feed it through, drop it down, feed it through, drop it down, feed it through. That's with everything, speedometer cable, anything that has to have a connection to the transmission of the engine, the same time it goes in, has to carefully be fed in there. Is that right, Ronald? That's it. What you doing, pumping a little iron there? I see you got a little bitty something going on there. A little something, something. A little something. A little something, something. Not bad for 60. 60? How old are you? 53. 53? Yeah. You got any intention of growing up? Or you pretty much Not going to happen. <laughs> I'll just keep coming to hang out. you young, isn't if it? I feel like I might be getting a little bit too grown up, I'm going to come hang out with you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the king of immature, right here. <laughs> So when I looked at the K-member over in the other room, it wasn't next to our Superbird, which is FJ5, 
limelight. Ron had it powder coated FJ6 sassy grass green. It looked like limelight to me. That's the problem. I'm colorblind, okay? Is that what you wanna hear? Colors are like kryptonite to me, okay? I can't see them very well. Until I put them together, then I can see them. So what we ended up doing was putting a silver one in. He, thank God, he brought a silver one that he had powder coated. I could have painted the green one the correct color, but it's our time frame, right? We just a couple of days to get the car done. It doesn't need to spend half a day down there getting painted and baked. So that was my decision, and ultimately I think the silver will look great. Okay, we're looking good here. Uh, the whole unit here would need to go back about three inches, so we should do that. This is exactly what we run into a lot of times over the years, where you have, what's the, what's the saying, too many chefs in the kitchen or whatever, right? Oh, hold up? Yeah, why don't you hold up? I'm about three Double inches check. away from that. Let Dave check his wire harness down for the firewall. Good. Everybody knows what the other person's thinking, and they say it. Do you think we have any chance of going straight back? We can go straight back. Straight we back. We plenty of room. Well, we did have plenty of room. We hit yep. something. But maybe if the other person is off one, so this guy's saying, well, go back a quarter inch. And the other guy said, well, he must want to go forward a quarter inch. Pull it back towards you, Doug. Hang on a second. We're good. Man, we are so good right now. It's got to be that harness. And so they're all kind of fighting each other. Instead of one person kind of orchestrating, making sure it goes one way. Yeah, no, it's hitting on that wire. So we're going to have oh. to get that plug in that box. Everybody's throwing their two cents in. It just it always makes things a lot more difficult. Right in there, which we can work. Once yeah, we gonna, get it into yeah. that pocket, right? Did we go too far? Oh, that's just, yeah, gravy. Giddy up. Gravy train. Oh, okay, Should I start doing the upper controllers? Yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. start putting that mother humper together. Right. Beautiful. It's just a constant, it's a constant balancing act with this. Everything's so tight in there that they're having a hard time. They've literally got to run the speedometer cable through the opening into the body as they lower it down onto it. It's it's that tight. So that's what they're doing right now. <clears throat> Ron, of course, has gone berserk and is putting the upper control arms in. Ron and I formed a friendship a few years ago. I can call him up out of the blue, say, listen, I've done it again. I've overpromised. Probably going to underdeliver. And he just rises to the occasion. And working with him, He's one of those guys that does listen to feedback. He's an intelligent guy. He thinks things out, and I like that. He's a methodical mechanic, kind of like I am. I'll, I'll picture, what's this move going to cost if we do it? Will it cost this move down here? And so working with him is usually efficient or proficient even in most cases. But mostly, he's got a good heart and he's fun to work with. So yeah, I totally trust him to work on anything we've got around here. He can't wait to go home. Been here for a few days. He wants to that is home. true. That is true. I understand. True. I understand. Been been a week and a half or so. Yeah, and you're ready to go home. Huh? Ready to go home. So now that we've got the main structure of the drivetrain installed, the transmission cross member, everything's fast in the car. That allows us to raise the car up and do all the plumbing. There's a lot of things that have to be connected underneath it, fuel lines and exhaust, etc. Once that's done, we'll lower the car back down, do the little bit of plumbing that's left in there, and maybe it'll be uh, fire up time. That's what we're hoping for. Uh, so it looks like everything is wrapped up on the Superbird. We're out of the woods. Ron came to the, Ron, my man, Magnum Force, Joe Dierte, put an E on the end, try to church it up, son. I'm gonna escort you out of here because I got stuff to do. Thank you very much, awesome. You were my 911 call. Couldn't have done it without you. Glad want to help. you to know, I love it. And if you Glad need any help. help, I want, someday, the scales of justice have to go the other way. So anyway, it's good to yeah. see you and tell Jen hi. I certainly will. And you know what, I actually brought you a surprise. So it's not kick Ron out time. He's apparently got a little surprise for me. It's outside in the trailer. What is it? The Daytona. What Daytona? You remember the blown Hemi nitrous injected Daytona? He was supposed to bring it last year when he came out with the Challenger with the Viper engine and when we were doing the 392 SEMA CUDA. I'm so excited. I'm not in any kind of a hurry to get rid of Ron. He is a cool cat, right? But when he stopped me and said that he brought a surprise up, I've been wanting to see this car forever. I absolutely love Pro Street. Everybody that knows me knows I love Pro Street. It's fun, it's old school, it's kind of what we did as kids. And uh, that's exactly what his is, one badass Daytona Charger. So I'm excited to see that. Did you really bring it? I didn't even me. see your trailer. It's in the trailer. You rat. It's outside. Oh, dude, 528 cubic inches of fire breathing nightmare. <laughs> Back half drive. We talking yeah. two second, three second quarter mile? Pro Street, <laughs> it actually, runs negative twos in a quarter mile. It actually sends the earth on its How cool axis. is that? A <laughs> super bird, a super bird yep. with a Hellcat. Yeah. And a Daytona with a 500. I mean, this is Mopar, baby. Oh yeah.
No that problem. is awesome. No problem. I love that car. You see some of the new cars? We got three rows now. I saw that, <laughs> yeah. You know, from what Ron's told me, I've seen pictures of it. I just, he was gonna bring it up last time when he came and he just couldn't. He brought up his Challenger instead. Brought up this real cool Viper powered Challenger, one of the first guys to do it. So we had fun with that. We went out on a ride and had a, had a ball with that car. That's, that's a fast car. So when Mark first saw the car, he had a lot of compliments for it. It was great. Uh, he, clearly he likes the car. So when we finally took off for, to take it for a spin, you don't know what he's gonna think. And uh, he very much enjoyed the way the car drove and handled and stopped and all that sort of thing. But well, things just begging to get dropped. The engine wants to run. Actually, Mark makes a good passenger. He, he didn't say anything. There was no screaming, almost no screaming. <laughs> Ron's got a, a screw loose. Whatever tells his hand and his foot to react the way they do in a car, something's wrong with it. Oh, I love it. Thank you. That's awesome. Okay, hang on here. You know me, I like to present things. Show me the money! <laughs> what the f is that? <laughs> the look on your face is priceless. <laughs> What'd you do? <laughs> Let's just say it involved fire. How's that? <laughs> I have no idea who ever came up with turnabouts fair play, but this is a great example of paybacks or karma. Do you remember Wendell's 71 Cuda? Hard top, 148, 426 Hemi. I kind of snowballed everybody into thinking it was a survivor, which technically it is a survivor. He got me the same way. You and Chris Jacobs partying a little too much or something? Yeah, apparently hanging out with the same crowd. Oh, no. <laughs> I guess we're having a fire sale here at GYC because we got uh, Chris Jacobs' car, which, like Mark said, burned to the ground. We got Wendell's poor 71 Hemi Cuda burned to the ground. Wow. And then we got Ron's 69 Dodge Daytona race car burned to the ground. Fire sale, GYC. Come get them while they're hot. I didn't know he burned his car to the ground. What is wrong with him? Why are him and Chris Jacobs obsessed with fire, right? You know, I've had my shop for 35 years. I've never pulled the trigger on a fire extinguisher. I got fire, baby. I need an extinguisher. Just water will be awesome. I can do it with water. Okay, I give. How'd you burn it to the ground? The Daytona had not been running for about two years, and we were just putting it all back together and buttoning up all the little loose ends. And uh, as you can see in the surveillance footage, the Daytona's wing is sticking outside the door. What happens is a little puddle develops into a giant puddle that just runs out the building. Right about then, inside the shop, one of my guys and another uh, business owner in our building tries to light the Daytona up. He lit it up all right. So what you then see is about a 20-foot plume go all the way to the top of the building. I mean, a massive explosion of fire and smoke just engulfed the entire car. Thankfully, it only torched the back half of the car, but uh, it melted all the aluminum in the car, so I had to redo all the aluminum, melted all the wires, all the paint. Uh, it, it didn't blow the two nitrous bottles, amazingly and both Mickey Thompson tires are still fully inflated, but it burned all the paint off the Daytona wing, the trunk lid, everything was toast. It was horrible. Yeah, yeah so it was a bad day. Oh yeah, but, yeah, uh, I've had them. Nobody, I'm having one right now. <laughs> nobody got hurt, yeah, so. Thank, praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah, it's all good, it's all good. Okay. So uh, where do you want to put the trailer? I'll tell you where you can shut the trailer. <laughs> oh, if you want to put the trailer out here. Oh. The parking lot, I'll. Okay. Have Cousin Dougie move it, and okay. I'll get on with the rest of my day, and can't thank you enough. Okay. Love you, brother. Thanks. Because that's what I wanted to do, is inherit another car.
Our 70 Supervert Tribute car, of course, is getting the Hellcrate, the Hellcat engine. Uh, the really unique thing about this Hellcat engine is a supercharger in it. I'm gonna put this bracket in here. Now, this bracket I made, so I did a, ca a cardboard template uh, to make this bracket. It's actually for the supercharger coolant bottle. It's a multiple spool supercharger system, and it's actually got its own cooling system to go with that supercharger because it gets so hot, it actually has coolant running through it through a 12 volt pump that runs through like a miniature radiator, which is a little bit bigger than a heater core, and then it cycles out through a reservoir and goes into the supercharger. So that bottle is gonna mount right here, and I had to space it just right, you know, to keep it from hitting a hood spring. And you can see it's kind of unique how to do some bends to it because this one's a little higher, that one's a little bit lower, then this one's gonna sit flat on my apron. I'm using one of my bolt holes from the factory heater hose mount, which is really cool. So I'm gonna grab a couple screws here real quick. I, as always, always use factory Mopar bolts. So I'm using all original bolts that we would normally use on a, on a car, you know, this year. So I'm gonna go ahead and get my bracket in there bolt the bottle down to my bracket. So there's that, and then this here is gonna mount right there like so. And so I'm gonna go ahead and use my anchor bolts. We try to keep things as OE correct as we can. And the cool thing about our 70 Superbird Tribute car is we wanna make it look like a real Superbird. Now these anchor bolts are 1970 style bolts that we would use normally on our ballast resistor, and you can see there's a little anchor on there. So that's what we normally use on the firewall for ballast resistor, voltage regulator, stuff like that. So I'm staying true to the 1970 Mopar. I'm gonna use these to actually mount my bracket down. So as I had said, we will be at SEMA with both cars. I have little to no doubt Jacobs will be running and driving under its own power. But we haven't even started the Superbird yet. Hasn't even ran. That means there's a multitude of things that could go wrong, like for example, not running. All right, so we'll be there with it, but we're almost out of time. There's no time left. I mean, literally, if we're gonna make the car run and drive before we load it in the reliable truck, we've gotta be doing that now. So far, the ghouls with help from Ron Jenkins at Magnum Force have kicked into high gear and cranked out the finishing touches on Chris Jacobs' 1968 GTX as well as getting the Hellcat Crate Hemi installed in our one-of-a-kind Hellbird. Still to come, the Hellbird needs work inside and out. Dave needs to customize some connections for the Hellcat to fire. Mark needs to install the iconic Superbird decals. And finally, the ghouls need to make sure the engine will fire up. Ready? Do it. Before this bird hits the road for Vegas. I got my bracket on my reservoir for my supercharger cooling system. So I got that mounted. I actually found, uh, because this car actually had a battery in it at one time, so we had a 446 barrel in here with an A33 four speed that we swapped out for this amazing Hellcat. So I actually had a battery tray in here, battery brackets and everything else. So what I did was I actually put the, one of the battery brackets that was already painted a limelight on there to stiffen up our hoses. So you can kind of see, I mean, it's not super rigid. There's a little bit of play in there, but it should work out just fine. So now I'm to the point into where everything's plumbed all the way around, and I'm getting ready to put in my actual heater core, miniature radiator, whatever you want to call it, for this supercharger system. Uh, the really unique thing about this Hellcat engine is a supercharger in it, and it's actually got its own cooling system. I had to kind of look at some old pictures that I found of, of actual Hellcat engines in you know Hellcat Challengers and figure out how to plumb it out. I like to keep everything looking as OE as possible. So if you were looking at a 1970 Superbird back in 1970 with a Hellcat engine with a supercharger and a cooling system on it, that's the way it would have looked. All right, what I'm gonna do now is, this is for my supercharger cooling system here. So it looks like a heater core, but this is what's cooling this Big old supercharger up there. That thing's got, I think, five or six rotors in it, so it gets hot, so it's got its own cooling system. So that's been one of the more difficult things to mock into place on this, 
And what I'm utilizing is all the factory brackets. They gave me the factory brackets with a lot of this. So I actually cut this one in half. The pump, it has a 12 volt pump that actually runs this whole system. So it's not actually connected to the engine. It's a 12 volt pump that cycles the coolant through the supercharger. It has a 15 pound radiator cap, so it's a pressurized system, just like your coolant system would normally be. What I ended up doing was I mounted the 12 volt pump up here uh, behind this headlight area here in the 70 Dodge Cornet uh, fender. And I got my hose, cut a hole here, got my hose coming through here. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna go into this, it's gonna come out of the cooler, go here, then cycle back in up here. You can kind of see where these hard lines are. I utilized all the factory lines, all the factory clamps and everything, the factory bottle, the whole nine yards. So I'm utilizing every little piece that Mopar gave me because I want it to look like this is the way it would have looked in 1970 if this engine was in here. So that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to use as much of their hose as I can, as many of their clamps as I can. So what I do is I got both of my lines kind of in here, my in and out set up. Got some of these little nipples and stuff to run through, but right now I'm gonna put this bracket on here, but on my Superbird nose, uh, we're actually using an actuator to run the headlights on this. So I got this motor unit that's gonna be sitting like right in here. So I had to do a lot of measuring to make sure I had room and everything. So what I come up with is I'm using their factory bracket with the rubber insulators and everything to mount this. And the top plate of my nose comes up here. So when these screws come through, I gotta allow clearance. So I can't just bolt this right to this plate. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna step this down a little bit so that either I'll have clearance for my screws whenever that top piece comes on, but then still be able to reach all my hoses. On the cooling system on the supercharger, they sent me the pump, the heater core, uh, some of the lines, a lot of the hard lines in the reservoir and everything, and they actually had the plate, you know, that held the pump. But on the Hellcat, that plate and the heater core and everything mounts in the Hellcat Challenger right in the front, all in one piece. I, of course, did not have that room. So I actually mounted the 12 volt pump inside the front part of the left front fender. So I actually had the pump mounted in the front fender. It came through the actual air dam, through the radiator support, all that area where I actually had to run the plumbing. So I actually had to fabricate a bracket, which was really cool because I was actually able to use Mopar's original bracket and just cut it, add a piece to it, had George weld it up for me. And I actually mounted that right on the front left fender so I could mount that pump right there and run the hoses right through that inner part of the fender. So that was the only piece I really had to fabricate. And then I was able to use the rest of the framework uh, to mount the heater core to the front part of the radiator. So in all in all, I used a lot of the original parts that would have came on a 2017 Hellcat, just had to add a little bit of metal. I'm super nervous. First time I wired up a Hellcrate engine. So I'm just hoping and praying that this is gonna be a one-shot deal. It's gonna light up the first time. We, we're down to hours pretty much before the car has to leave for SEMA. Any you know problems or altercations that we're gonna have right now is devastating. So I kind of checked everything twice, made sure I got it all right. So we're keeping our fingers crossed that it's gonna work. Seems that our Superbird is ready for the cherry on the top of the cake. Yeah. He has been working so hard at getting everything built out, done a great job. You utilized a lot of original openings and the core support that would have been for AC lines and things like that. And that's, that's awesome, it's a good job, I love it. Yeah. So now, the uh, two and a half ton nose cone is ready to go on, <laughs> the cherry on the top. So on the conversion kit, to take the Roadrunner from a Roadrunner and turn it into a Superbird, we bought that kit from Ted Janik. What you're doing is you're taking parts that were made originally out of steel and or aluminum, and you're changing them to a fiberglass. This was something Ryan deserves total hats off to. I mean, Ryan did a fabulous job, you know, fabricating all the pieces that actually go into this nose. I don't know how many hours we got into that nose, but uh, it looks phenomenal. So right now he's just finishing sucking down all the bolts on it. When he's done, he can wire the headlights so they'll work and then he'll go back to putting the rest of the interior together. Yep. Nice. So now that the big part of the Superbird is together that make it a Superbird, like the, the nose cone and the wing, I can go ahead and start putting the graphics on. The big Plymouth down the side, I gotta do that. I got the standing bird. I'll tell you, he's awesome. 
I mean, the guy can lay down decals almost blindfolded. Decals can be a real bear, all right? They can be a pain in the butt. And if I screw it up, I'm screwing up my own work, so I have to write the check. I think Mark kind of chomps at the bits watching the cars out here whenever they get down to the point where it's uh, ornamentation on the car, you know, whether it be body tags or especially decals. So it's great when you have my reference room with the original diagrams, the original blueprints of how things went, the exact piece of paper that 50 years ago snapshot in time another guy was using to put the same graphics on. Everything came out great on the Superbird, succeeded perfectly at installing a Superbird decal kit from our friends at Phoenix Graphics. You're welcome, I made y'all look good. That big huge Plymouth on the side there on the quarter panel is just so unique, it just kind of makes the car pop. And of course that Roadrunner, who doesn't like the Roadrunner? Especially when he's holding the helmet because you know he's gonna be going fast. I'm getting down to the wire on the 70 Superbird. What I'm doing right now is installing all the windshield trim on the front windshield. I install it by hand. It's kind of tedious. You, you just kind of get a feel for it. Now that I got all the window trim installed in our 70 Superbird, I can get it up in the air and get that unique, accurate exhaust system. Our exhaust system doesn't quite fit like we wanted to with these TTI headers, so I'm actually gonna get George over from the metal shop, have him cut up this exhaust just a little bit, do a little bit of modifying, a little bit of welding, and we'll have it fit perfect. So when we put the collectors on there, George actually kind of figured out where he needed to make his cut, went ahead and cut off the existing exhaust. Then, since the collector doesn't exactly match up with the exhaust pipe, he had to put a couple little elbows in there, so we took pieces of pipe, kind of fabbed them into place, got nice smooth bends on it so we get a good airflow and got it all welded into place. Does a fabulous job. So this is the moment of truth. I'm ready. Been hard at it, lots of pieces oh, and parts man. in place. There's a multitude of things under there that can go bad. The engine's in, the drivetrain's in, everything's connected. We have the battery ready to connect. We literally are at the point now where we can start this car, or at least try to start this car. So Dave's gonna get in the car. This, is a, this uses an electronic fuel pump on it, not like the old cars that were mechanical. So yeah. he's gonna go in, turn the key to the on position. That'll energize our fuel pump. Once it creates the pressure that it needs, it'll shut off. At that point, you're ready to go into the start mode. Yeah. He'll crank it over and hopefully it will start. Fire the baby up. I mean, uh, I got everything checked off in the car. You know, it, it seems like I've only been working on this car hardcore for three weeks. Uh, my mind's just been spinning and spinning, spinning. Stress level is at just all time maximum. So we're ready for step ready? one. I'm ready. Let's, Let's do, do it. it. Let's do ignition. It's like a countdown. Like, right. like a Paul, like a <sighs> countdown. Make sure that baby's in neutral. This is the first Hellcat engine using the Mopar controller on the planet today. You're talking about first offs? Yeah, this is the first off. Could there be problems? At least a thousand. Am I hoping for none? Absolutely, because we have just, I will say, very little time to make it to the show. You got the key on? Yeah, key's on. Key's on. Fuel pump is powered up. You're in neutral. Yep. I got no foot on anything. I'm just gonna crank it. This thing has 707 horsepower, fuel injected. I mean, all computer controlled uh, with you know rack and pinion steering coil over shocks, I mean, this, this is just the ultimate muscle car. Ready? Do it. You know, pray to God that the thing lights up, so. You got the key on? Yeah, key's on. Key's on. Fuel pump is powered up. You're in neutral. Yep. I got no foot on anything. I'm just gonna crank it. Ready? Do it. You know, pray to God that the thing lights up, so. Yes! Woo! Listen to that! Listen to that. Oh my God! Yeah! yeah. <laughs> Woo! Fast idle. That's what I'm talking about. It was an amazing group effort because here we are right now, looking like we're gonna make it. Wow, it's one of those things that you don't know till you know. Boy, that ah, thing sounds so good. It does sound good, huh? The first Superbird on the planet, on this planet, maybe on any planet, 
to have the Hellcat engine now installed using all Mopar components. <laughs> there it is. There it is. That's the Hellbird dance. You know karate? I know crazy. A lot of pressure this time of year for us, graveyard cars. Got a lot of people that are counting on us to get the cars done on time, counting on us to show up down there. Not just put the cars together, but put them together correctly. Something we can be proud of. So sometimes when all the smoke clears and everybody's done chanting your name, it's just you and the car you built. This is what it means down to the wire at SEMA. We got a loose little radiator hose clamp and so we're tightening it like two seconds before the car loads on the truck, so. That looks good, man. Cool car. Chris is gonna be happy. From a Mopar man to another Mopar man. Congratulations, buddy. Heading down to Las Vegas. Sin City. everybody down at SEMA 2017 kicking it old school come by check it out I've lost 26 pounds since April by the way you probably didn't notice because the camera adds weight but and I haven't even been sick so please try to get in diet and exercise my friends diet and exercise did you lock it come on man <laughs> It's really cool that we were able to get the cars done, to have them run and to drive and to look and to be finished. And, and the crowds around the cars is unbelievable. So it was kind of nerve wracking. And then the president of the company, Mr. Pietro Gorlier, called me up on stage. And had me talk about the Superbird and the controller and how it went and what we think. Uh, he also had to give me a little bit of crap because of my color, color blindness, why I like green colors, but uh, all very good and all very humbling, even for me. Well, Brendan, we have a little surprise for you. Oh, really? Oh, yes. Oh, God. We really consider you one of the top ambassadors of our brand. So to show our thanks, this is an award that we are gonna oh. institute this year for as the 2017 Mobile Brand Advocate Award. Congratulations. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Anywho, um, obviously it's big. It's uh, probably solid crystal. That's awesome. Oh, I just had something in my eye up there. Yeah, it's a lot of stuff in no, it's a lot of stuff in the air up there. So, point being, you know, they wanted to present me with something that showed their appreciation for my dedication to the brand, and that's what this is about. All right, this doesn't make me smarter than everybody else or funnier. Well, I'm already probably funnier because I'm a natural comedian, but is what it is, you know, you don't let stuff like that go to your head. Just a guy doing his job. One of the funner parts was when they called me up on stage with some of the other uh, car show guys. My job was to be there and talk about um, what a superb job I do. I think the name of the bit was Masters of Their Trade or something. Um, so anyway, that's obviously, again, nothing doesn't make me better than them. Um, but they wanted to get my input on what it's like to be a skilled master in Mopars. So, yeah, it was fun. Hanging out with Chris Lee. I call her CL. Uh, she's pretty cool. She's shorter in person than she is um, on TV. But uh, she is just as adorable. The opportunity 
to be able to continue keeping these cars on the roads for the next generations. That's what this has done. That's what the Mopar crate and the controller has allowed us to do. That's right. You know, we have a Facebook page for Graveyard Cars. I was the one that started it way back, I think about nine, eight or nine years ago. And I remember getting so excited when I got 100 people. Well, I got excited when I got 10 people. Then I get 100, then I get 1,000. It's like, oh, where's this gonna end? Well, we're at 3 million now. I swear all three million were down there at SEMA. I mean, you could not walk, it was shoulder to shoulder. The camera guys are fighting for their lives just to, to stay up with us. And uh, it, it shows that maybe at the end of the day, what I'm doing does affect a lot of people's memories. So for me, yeah, that's the funnest part, is just reliving the memory, forgetting the nuts, the bolts, and all the part numbers that make the cars what they are and all that. How about just the, the grassroots behind the passion and the love for Mopars? I mean, truly, I think, I think that's what I enjoy the very most about the SEMA show is sharing that with so many people. One of the cool little displays there was a 1970 Barracuda four-door sedan. I don't care about the politics. What I am here to say is that that was probably the best looking four-door that would have been on the market back in the day. I liked it. And whether the rest of the world likes it or doesn't like it, it doesn't matter. But to me, that's how I operate. So when I see something like that, I think, well, it kind of reminds me of my modified Dragula with the 340 in it, or my hearse with the 440 and dual fours in it. It's just something that he wanted to express his passion for the hobby with, and I love it. I thought it was cool. It's nice meeting up with Bill, Bill Goldberg. Uh, I called him a few weeks ago and I asked him if he'd have any time at all. We didn't really have any budget to do anything, but we're just a bunch of car guys that wanted to get together. and. He didn't care about the budget. What he cared about was talking Mopars. And it was, truly, it was out of the kindness of his heart. To me, it's like this hobby should be based around the entire picture of people who love the cars. And so for Bill Goldberg, our common thread that bonds us together is the fact that we love Mopars. And that's as genuine and as real as I can put it. Awesome week. Chris Jacobs' uh, GTX came off beautiful, absolutely. I, I think he had so cool much build. fun. That was great stuff. The Superbird, again, you're cramming so much stuff into the last couple of days, you don't even have a chance to catch your breath. In reality, when you talk about all the things that we did in a few it's days, we, we did really good. We did good. Like I said, I was going to be there no matter what, but I wanted to make sure that when we did show up there, the cars were functional and I could move them. Did, did you happen to catch my red carpet? Uh, I don't think I've made it in time for your red carpet. Yeah. I'm sure so it was a anyway, treat. It was, yeah, so. Hundreds of thousands of people out in the audience wanting to see the Superbird pull up. You know, it's a little humbling when you're up on stage and the president of Mopar brings out an award and uh, announces that you're the very first brand ambassador to Mopar. So it doesn't mean I'm any different, right? I still put my pants on one leg at a time, all right? Just happen to have an award that tells me how to do it. <laughs> you want to hold it? I mean, sure. You're never going to have one on your own, so you might as well Probably not, no. Why don't you hold it up here? Now give me my award back because there's no reason for you to... I didn't want it, Dad. You made me hold it. That's yeah, great. We're all really impressed. Are we done? Okay, we're done. But, yep, yep, we're done. Yeah. Mopar. See the M? Mark? Warman. <laughs>